And welcome back to You Rejoin at 120. I am Jeff Quint, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Virginia uh, as part of my computer science degree. And I was actually kind of lucky in that when I started, I was actually going to take a philosophy minor. And so I took some classes in philosophy uh, that, although I never ended up getting a philosophy minor, uh, really kind of informed my view of the, the background, the historical backdrop of what computer science was uh, before I really got into the, the kind of really meaty STEM stuff. Uh, and this is kind of an example of it. Uh, so uh, the, the kind of point here is that the study of knowledge, or epistemology, is the study of artificial intelligence or at least it's one of the ways that you can approach artificial intelligence is through knowledge and how knowledge works and how knowledge works in relation to us uh, and so that you can kind of approach the problem if you are new to computer science you maybe even don't know how to program yet uh, and if you're just interested in AI and want to get into it uh, one of the ways you can do so without getting too deep into the mathematics of it uh, is to start with the philosophy behind it. Uh, and so modern AI students and computer science students like to kind of forget uh, that there was this entire history before Alan Turing. Uh, and yes, there was a lot of progress that has been made uh, since Turing's life. Uh, but there was thousands of years of philosophers thinking about thinking. Uh, and it's not that they didn't accomplish anything during that entire time. Uh, although they could have accomplished more, uh, there was, again, a lot of smart people putting a lot of resources, a lot of time, uh, a lot of ink on paper about this topic, even before we had computers at all. John McCarthy, uh, who actually, I think, just kind of passed away not that long ago, uh, coined the term artificial intelligence as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. And so, within my lifetime, the the guy who originated this entire topic, uh, although of course Turing you know, kind of predated him about thinking about intelligent machines, uh, McCarthy really was the, the person uh, for AI and the, the guy who got the ball rolling in a serious way. Uh, and so he is kind of approaching it as a science and an engineering uh, perspective. Uh, and so that's not something that you're going to get by default uh, if you just go into epistemology. Uh, but it, it's worth considering that uh, it's often the case in history where things that become sciences or things that are sciences were not necessarily always so. The original uh, kind of background of chemistry was alchemy and there was a lot of people doing uh, chemical uh, combinations of various kinds without actually doing so in a scientific manner as we discussed in the alchemy video. Uh, but Again, in this case, there's a lot of people kind of working and thinking about thinking without kind of doing so in a rigorous enough way to really uh, accomplish much uh, by nature of science. But now we have the science, we have the engineering, uh, so we can at least try to, to approach this topic in a different way. But again, the old stuff is still there. The research is still there. The, the consideration and planning and work has been done. A lot of the legwork and hard work has already been done before we even get to computers. And a lot of the places where the philosophers of the, the you know, hundreds of years back have failed is they had no uh, ability to implement the lower level details that we kind of take for granted. Uh, kind of as an aside, if you go back to Kurt Gödel, uh, a, a lot of the work in his main uh, kind of result in the incompleteness theorem uh, is mostly just something that you would expect out of uh, ASCII or uh, any character or Unicode or something like that. The idea that you could encode characters into numbers, that was kind of a new thing. And so that's an example of some low level kind of really basic thing that you have to do in order to get any work at all out of computers that the philosophers just didn't have access to. And so they struggled improving their results because they didn't have access to these low level tools uh, these kind of uh, uh, libraries that we, we absolutely take for granted today. But you have these things available. So if you take their ideas and actually try to implement them, you might find that some of them work. Uh, and this is kind of equally true uh, of 
the, you know, so in, in addition to philosophers who have been doing this kind of thing for a while, uh, is that there has been uh, other areas that have been putting work into this problem as well. So for example, in law, uh, in jurisprudence, in legal theory, a lot of, again, heavy lifting has been going on to kind of verify what exactly it means for a judge to consider properly and fairly uh, information. And what does it mean for them to, to be able to learn things from that information? And how do they do it? How can they do it in the best way, etc.? cetera? Uh, and the same thing with medicine. Medicine uh, would have put a lot of thought into making the right conclusions so that lives can be saved. And they did, again, make some progress towards this. And so if you want to learn artificial intelligence, I would suggest at least the place to start is here. As in other videos, this particular topic is related to a lot of other things, uh, and a lot of things we've already talked about, uh, starting with grades. Uh, because to some extent, people want grades to be an expression of knowledge and the things that you know. As we discussed in that video, that isn't necessarily always going to be all that accurate. But again, th the way we kind of approach grades in university and education in general is that there are these kind of groups of knowledge that are interrelated in a certain way and that we have to think about them in that certain way and we have to learn about them in that certain order or in that certain kind of context etc and it may be worth considering that if we kind of build something that's capable of uh, doing thinking that those kind of modules will still exist in its uh, programming on some level uh, it's related to the the uh, kind of Nord uh, video that we discussed. Uh, in in that, if you don't know what a term means, you can go look it up. But again, machines can do that too. Uh, we have a lot of resources, a lot of data encoded in digital forms and using JSON LD or whatever that you can teach uh, some system to look things up if they don't know them. So if you can get to the point where it's capable of doing that, you might be able to get some bang for the buck for doing so related to the different approaches of uh, video uh, because the way that memory is stored the more ways that you have to remember something the stronger the memory and so for example if we uh, in addition to learning about epistemology in a silly YouTube video like this you actually go and read a textbook and then you go read some research papers then you discuss it with your peers you know each time or each different way you approach it is going to inform your mind uh, the kind of details and nuance uh, and just kind of reinforce it in, in a way that will help you remember. This is kind of worth pointing out. It's relating to the er, related to the one three four five six seven eight nine ten video because to a great extent knowledge uh, and patterns are, are related. Right? You you learn things by detecting patterns in your experiences, and you remember them and know them again depending on whether or not your your mind is ordered in a certain way. So it's worth looking for the patterns. Uh, involved. It's related to the presuppositions video because we can ask the question, what does knowledge presuppose? And what do you need in order to know something? It's related to the argument from ignorance and silence videos because to some extent we kind of start ignorant. Uh, as you know, young babies we don't really know anything coming into the world. Uh, we, we have reasons uh, to, to learn uh, but we again have to kind of start somewhere and so there's this kind of regressive or regression problem where we have to go from not knowing anything to knowing things and there, there's kind of a problem in, in, if you are purely talking about syllogistic reasoning and if you assume by default you can't start from ignorance then again you know we're, we're running into some kind of a contradiction in how we're approaching things there it's relating to circular reasoning and recursion because artificial intelligence is filled with recursive things. Uh, Lisp, the artificial language of, or intelligence language of choice, is based in almost entirely on recursion. Uh, there's just so many places where you can get into kind of learning something and then building on that thing that you've learned in a circular way uh, that just kind of, kind of comes up over and over and over again in these two topics. It's related to the analogy uh, video because what can we codify what happens when we make an analogy? Is there a way for us to describe the, the, the how mathematically or otherwise you, you can generalize from a situation? This is very much an AI problem, but 
but again, it's, it's going to be kind of related to uh, knowledge and how that knowledge can be generalized in a very broad and general way. If you want to learn a little bit about that particular vantage point, uh, it's talked about a little bit in my 10 Ideas 50 Years video, the kind of how to do that, uh, it's, although it's a little bit high level. It's related to the argument from incredulity, because again, we're, we're dealing with credibility and what exactly does it mean for something that we could know uh, or, or, or something we could perceive for that to be incredulous? Uh, it, what, what does it mean for something to have credibility for us to believe it? It's related to the fallacy of the beard video because we know that a lot of the things that we learn fall on spectrums. And so we can get into the situation where can we know something uh, if you know, it, it is one of these spectrum cases. So, if, you know, can we know that something is alive, for example? Uh, what, where do we draw the line in order to define whether that something is alive or not? And if, when can we s say that we are justified in believing that that something is alive? Again, another question. I'm not going to provide the answers to a lot of these questions, but it's worth considering the question because it has implications when we actually try to build a machine that does its own reasoning, because it's going to have to make a judgment call on that on some level, and it's going to make that judgment call based on rules that you describe as an answer to that kind of question. It's related to the Euthydemus video, because language complicates things. It complicates things considerably, especially in modern languages like English that have had all, you know, thousands of years of uh, different groups working together and breaking uh, symmetry within the language, uh, but again, it, it just complicates things considerably, and you, you really have to wonder about the implications of imperfect language on our ability to reason in general. Uh, and so, there's uh, you know word games and uh, kind of dishonest language, uh, which we'll discuss more as we go. But uh, again, language and knowledge are really, really tightly coupled, and if you can understand. Uh, how the, those two particular things work together, you can make progress towards uh, automating how systems could deal with it. It's related to the package deal and the equivalence in the association videos. Uh, because how we perceive groups of things and how we perceive relationships between things and when we are justified in believing that they always come together is, again, something that we are going to have to solve when we start building systems that think for themselves. Because those things, or those systems will have to tell whether or not two things always happen together, or two things are always part of the group, etc., etc. It's related to the argument from emotion. Because emotion and knowledge are linked uh, in that uh, your memory will record things a little bit more clearly if there's an emotional reason for you to do so. So you will remember some situations more than others. Uh, it's not 100% accurate that, you know, when there's emotion, you'll remember it. But again, emotion and memory are, are linked at a very deep level. And you can probably remember some, you know, part of your life, if you're watching this video, where you were, you know, very angry or very uh, hurt or, or afraid or, or some very strong emotion was affecting you and why that emotion was affecting you. You can probably remember the context. Why, again, because emotion is tied to memory storage. And if you want to learn how memory works and how we can learn and uh, kind of encode those memories, how we can think using them, uh, emotion is going to be not that far away. And we're going to have to account for how emotion works if we want to build an artificial intelligence that kind of mimics us. But again, it may be useful to learn how emotion actually does work and actually does affect how we remember things so that we can kind of draw inspiration from that. It's related to the Proctor Hawk video because how do we learn causal relationships? How do we build a, 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 a infrastructure of science that can untangle complicated relationships where one thing causes another? Uh, this is going to be a problem that comes up a lot in epistemology and that artificial intelligence systems are going to have to solve if they are going to be useful to us. It's related to the burden of proof video because depending how you define knowledge, determines what, to some extent, what constitutes proof. And so you have to kind of set or have some rule or think about in some way what constitutes justification for believing something and what constitutes justification for knowing that something. 
these are questions you're going to want to look into. And again, the way you answer those questions are going to inform how you build this artificial intelligence system. Uh, we can ask, go look at the is video. Uh, so we can ask what do we know versus what ought we know, uh, and kind of the relationship between those two things. Uh, we can look at the consequentialism video because we can ask whether or not we should be learning or knowing things purely on consequential grounds. You know, is it worth, I was just reading in my notes today, and that if at some point in 2009 I kind of convinced myself that it may only be worth knowing about things that you can predict rather than the past, because the past is always going to have some kind of mystery behind it in a way that the future may have kind of less of, in a sense. Uh, so, for example, is it worth trying to know things for pure research? Is it worth having a department in your company that does nothing but just try to do blue sky pure research? That's a question of knowledge. That's a question of, is it you know, useful, is it possible to have such a thing as pure knowledge or basic research or blue sky research? These are the kinds of questions, again, that the answers to those questions will form when you try to automate those things, when you try to build a department that's capable of, of coming up with blue sky research on its own out, out of silicon, uh, that you're going to have to figure out the answers to some of these questions. It's related to the gambler's fallacy and to Bayes, because artificial intelligence and sti statistics are really related in terms of what can you conclude based on the evidence that you have. And that, again, is going to be uh, very, very deeply in, in involved with uh, Bayes, which we'll get into maybe later. And, again, it's related to the alchemy video, because how can we make this topic into a science? How can we approach this topic in, in such a way that we're not just kind of uh, combining things without purpose, uh, that we're not learning from our past mistakes, etc.? And so it's worth thinking about that as well. So, in general, so truth, belief, knowledge, justification, coherence between beliefs, the level of truth, all of these things are going to be both discussed at length within epistemology and artificial, or artificial intelligence. Uh, they may use different terms. They may have different ideas how, how these things work. But again, a lot of thinking has been done on these two things, uh, and not everyone who's involved with one knows about what's going on in the other. So, it, again, you'll encounter questions like, uh, how can we know? What can we know? What is knowledge? How do we acquire it? How is it stored? Can we be certain of anything, like 100% certain? Uh, what is justification? What are necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge? What are the sources of knowledge? What is the structure of knowledge? And what is the limits of knowledge? So what is it possible for us to even know? Um, like if everything, if you converted the entire universe to a mind, what could you know with that mind? That's that sort of question. Uh, is justification internal or external to one's mind? Uh, the question of rationalism versus empiricism, and the, the kind of theory versus experiment, and how do you mix uh, experiment and theory together in the, the best way? Uh, can you give other people knowledge? Can you teach? How, how is it possible for people to to learn from each other? Uh, is there a better way of teaching and distributing knowledge than the way that we're currently doing so? I.e., you know, is there a be better way of getting this idea across than this silly YouTube video? Uh, it, when should we stop believing something? Uh, what, or can we ever be uh, certain that something causes something else? Uh, again, going back to the causality problem. Is it ever enough to describe something? So, you know, when we describe a certain amount of detail, uh, is, is it even possible to describe 100% some idea or some bit of knowledge? Do we know things that are described to us? So if I tell you something, can you be said to know it? Uh, do we, or do we need to directly experience it or in some way or have some connection between our experiencing of that thing uh, and that knowing of that thing? And so the, the, the kind of viewing from the, the AI side, the central problems uh, or goals of AI include reasoning, knowledge, planning, learning, natural language, natural language processing, communication, perception, and the ability to move and manipulate objects <coughs> in an intelligent way. So most of these problems are open problems in computer science, and we're making progress on them. Uh, the, uh, 
self-driving cars, for example, uh, apply some of these kind of things to automobiles uh, in a very narrow context of driving. Um, but again, there's there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, and some of the results that we could be using uh, have already been thought of. And it's worth pointing out that uh, epistemology comes up uh, pretty consistently when theists argue with atheists. And this is one reason that you may, as a society, be interested in keeping both types of people around, because they get into this particular problem or topic very quickly, and the answers to the problems that they're going to have with each other are going to be very important if you start doing artificial intelligence. And so it may be worth it to have these kind of low-level uh, background debates happening just so that we're keeping our thinking warm about thinking uh, so that we can, when we need to, pull out the AI research as it, as it kind of comes up. From seekfind.net, and this is the from the Christian perspective, and I'm going to quote, uh, the ultimate result of the secular secularist trilemma is that secularists cannot know the difference between made-up stuff and reality, which is actually true. Uh, when you get down to a fundamental level at the level of epistemology, you start having problems describing what is and is not real in a systematic way. And again, the ways that we make progress on that particular problem are going to inform our ability to make these machines that can solve the problem in the same way. Going back to SeekFind, quote, uh, Agrippe, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Agrippe's uh, trilemma is that all knowledge can be known or can only be known by infinite regress, circular reasoning, or axiom slash uh, self-justifying ideas. And again, this is something that comes out of epistemology. When we start to look at what exactly is the foundation of our knowledge, what when we really boil down everything we know, how do we know everything that we know? Do we just believe it because somebody told us to believe it? But, you know, if, if that was our only basis of belief of anything, we would be subject to the whims of liars, politicians, marketers, and bullshit artists. And so that can't possibly be it. And so you can start to look and question every way that we know things until you get to one of those three things. And in, again, we, we can discuss the implications of that, but that is, again, the implications are going to be important when we get to artificial intelligence. So it's not necessarily worth discussing them here, just to point them out that there is this problem, there is this way of looking at knowledge that you can run into this particular problem, this particular wall, this particular limit of what we know, how we know, and how best we can improve it. So, in general, uh, this has been a very, very high-level overview of the, the issues and problems and ways that these two are interrelated. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be a full way of answering all these questions. That, again, is up to you, the listener, to make progress on these problems, to go, you know, put some effort into them, see what you can get out of them, see what you can build, uh, see if what you can pull from the thoughts and the hard work of thousands of years of incredibly smart people uh, can be used in the modern world today. See if you can do it, uh, and uh, hopefully that works out for you. Uh, as usual, uh, if there are any questions or if you'd like to learn more about either epistemology or artificial intelligence, feel free to ask anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, and as usual, there should be a Bitcoin address in the bottom here somewhere so that you can send us uh, Bitcoin so that we can support our whiteboard marker uh, fund. Uh, and uh, as usual, hopefully you enjoy. Uh, see you next video.